Well, good evening and welcome to EdChat Interactive. My name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm going to be your host this evening and you're in for a treat because we have two incredibly knowledgeable people, knowledgeable in both uh, change management in education and technology in education, Nancy Mangum and Shayla Rexrode from the Friday Institute. And they're going to be uh, leading a discussion with you all on leading personalized and digi digital learning change management and distributed leadership. Now, before we get started, I want to go through a little bit about EdChat Interactive. Uh, our purpose in providing these is that we believe that there's a lot of great things going on in education, but the way to spread them is not through uh, these talking head webinars. It's through uh, shared experiences through conversations, uh, through reflection. And so we wanted to do something a little bit differently. Uh, we wanted to pick people who, well, first of all, we wanted to pick people who really were doing interesting things. And second of all, give them a forum, forum where they could talk with other educators and and have discussions because that's really the way we all learn best is through interacting, discussing, um, and engagement. So we're going to encourage you all to be very active in um, in this session and to uh, to come up on stage and 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 talk with the leaders um, to uh, talk amongst each, each other. And in order to do that, we've used this package called Shindig, which is what we're using now. And a, just a couple things about Shindig. Uh, one way of interacting is through text chat. And you see in the bottom of your screens, I'll, I'll make this a little bit larger uh, for a second. Uh, you see in the bottom of your screens, there's, there's a bunch of, there's a menu of, of avatars, one of which is text chat. So what I'd like you to do now is click on that text chat avatar and I'd like you to type in some you know introduce yourself to the other people here and maybe uh, pose a question to our, our leaders and what you'll see is when you click on that there's a text chat and I'll make this larger again uh, so you can see it um, well, maybe maybe now it's larger, whichever. <laughs> um, you can uh, grab the top of it. You can you can move it. If you want to close it entirely, you can click on the X to close. On the lower right-hand corner of it, you can expand it or contract it. But in the meantime, uh, introduce yourself to the other people here. Uh, I will say that there is one person here tonight who can't see at all what you're typing, and that's me. So if you type anything disparaging about me, don't worry, I won't see it. Now, uh, other ways of interacting, uh, one is asking a question. If you were to click on the ask question, I see somebody's raised their, clicked on the raise hand, which is another way of interacting. Uh, but if you click on the ask question, that poses a question to me. Um, if, uh, and then I can pass it along to the leaders, or if it's a technical question, I can answer it myself. And um, if you click on the raise hand button, that's saying that you want my attention. So um, I see right now, Nancy has uh, actually raised her hand. So I'm gonna simulate what would normally be is I would normally say, if somebody wants to talk with uh, Nancy or Shayla, click on the raise hand button and we can bring you up. Nancy's raised her hand and I'm gonna bring her up. Hi, great. Well, and you know, Mitch, I had a question um, that somebody posed in the chat and I think I think Shayla got the answer, but um, just kind of curious, is the text chat the same as the room chat? Um, you know something, that's a good question. My screen is completely different from your screen. So I don't have okay. either one, okay? okay. Um, so I think, that, I think that they are. I think, I know that on text chat, you can chat with a particular person or you can chat with everybody. The room will be everybody up to 25 people who are here tonight, and then it automatically breaks into rooms. Um, so um, I'm gonna bring you back down and just continue my introduction, but I wanted to show people how people can come up. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Great. Okay, so we've covered three ways of interacting, text chat or room chat, which I'll have to find out what it does, uh, asking question and raising hands. Um, the, uh, the other way of interacting, let me go on, okay, is through small group discussions. Now there's gonna be times tonight where we pose a question and we say, you know, find another person and discuss this with another person. So if you have a video camera, uh, 
and especially the mo the absolute necessity is that you have a microphone on your computer, you can have a discussion with one, two, or three other people about a topic. So what I'd like you to do now is to try that out, is, to, is if you have a microphone on your computer and, it, and it's on, click on the avatar of at least one other person and introduce yourself and talk to each other about what you'd like to learn this evening. So I'll get the uh, question up there and um, and, leave, and, and leave this question. And I'm going to give you two minutes. I'm going to bring myself down um, to encourage you to, uh, to form groups. And then in a minute or two, I'll come back up. So it's fun, right? Um, coming on to one of these things, getting to meet new people, getting to talk to them. Now, if you're hearing an echo, uh, in my voice as I'm talking and you're hooked up with another person, you can do one of two things. Uh, you can either, let me go, uh, use the X here to disconnect from that person, or here you see that there's a mute microphone. If you mute your microphone, if both of you mute your microphones, then you won't get the echo. Uh, so that's, you know, so uh, it depends on if you want to stay connected to that person but not talk to them um, or disconnect from that person, and that'll get rid of the echo. Um, just a, just a little bit we have on January 16th, we have Scott McLeod coming back for uh, Are Your Children's Classes Dangerously Irrelevant? Uh, he is really, well, he's really knowledgeable and he's really funny. So um, this will be really enjoyable um, and packed with information. You'll enjoy that. February 13th, uh, Nancy's going to be back this time, I think, with Marianne Wolf, but possibly Shayla as well. And uh, this is part of a three-part series with the Friday Institute on uh, changing the culture within schools in order to be more effective. Second part is February 13th. And we I don't didn't put the date here, but there's, um, there's an interesting session coming up. We were started because, um, we started originally because you know, Tom Whitby and Steve Anderson uh, had started the EdChat hashtag. That's how we have the name EdChat Interactive. And what we're gonna be trying in February is the day after the Ed Chat, we're going to pick some of the most interesting topics from that Ed Chat, and we're just going to have a discussion with the people who are in the Ed Chat and Twitter, um, talking where everybody's going to get, have a chance to talk about whatever the the, the topics were from the previous night. So. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. That should be a really interesting session. And uh, I know a number of you are from North Carolina, and a friend of mine, Steve Piha, is also from North Carolina. And we're going to be talking in the next week, and he'll, we'll probably have a session uh, coming up with him in the spring as well. So that's what's coming up. And now let me bring up uh, Nancy and Shayla from the Friday Institute. Uh, each of them has over 17 years of experience in education. They're authors, they're national keynote speakers, they're, um, they're critically acclaimed, they're great people. And uh, here I found Shayla. And let's see if I can find Nancy. Um, okay, and there's Nancy, and I'm gonna bring Nancy up. Good evening, everybody. And there's Nancy. Okay, Hi. well. Hi, well, welcome to EdChat Interactive. Thank you so much. And I understand that you guys have been working like double time because of all the cancellations because of weather, right? <laughs> yes, we've been dealing with some crazy weather here in North Carolina. You know, I think we had a cyclone bomb or something last week and it just kind of threw everything off. I, I know many of you all probably on the East Coast have, have been dealing with that. And those of you on the West Coast probably just kind of laughing at us a little bit too. Right, um, right. Well, or or those of you in the slides. North, right? Yeah. Like, yes. Mud, laugh the mudslides that have the, that, that's even worse. Well, yes. Oh, for <laughs> sure. For sure. Right. Definitely. No, we didn't have anything like that. So, um, yes. All kinds of interesting so it, things. Yeah. So I'm going to bring myself down so that, so, okay. cause I know you, you have a ton of stuff to go through and I'll expand your slides and just tell me when to advance them. And if you want me to come back up. Sounds great. And Mitch, great. You know, I feel like that introduction was like, you know, so like <laughs> no pressure here, Shayla, right? <laughs> None, whatever, whatsoever. None. <laughs> yes. Um, well, great. Well, welcome everybody. And I think Mitch, we can go to the next slide. Um, like Mitch said, I'm Nancy Mangum, and I'm the Associate Director of Digital Learning Programs at the Friday Institute. And um, I'm joined with, by Shayla Rexroad. 
Um, and Shayla is our senior lead facilitator at the Friday Institute. And some of you might know Shayla from her from her days at Discovery, um, but we are so excited to have her with us. She's been with us um, almost a year now. So we are excited to be together with you all tonight. Um, and we're going to give you a little bit of information about the Friday Institute. I know some of you are from North Carolina, but I think on the next slide, um, you'll see that the Friday Institute is part of NC State University. Um, we are a research and outreach arm of the College of Education. Um, you see our beautiful building there. Many of you have been to the Friday Institute, both been in North Carolina or some of our other friends on the on the chat too, I think have been down. Um, but the Friday Institute, we like to say that we are where we combine research, policy, and practice together. So um, Shayla and I, along with our other colleagues, spend um, several days a week in schools, talking with administrators, talking with coaches and teachers, but we also have the time to do the research and um, look at policies and best practices. So um, we like to say that our job is kind of like um, like Disneyland. It's pretty pretty amazing, and we get to meet um, amazing educators every day. Anytime um, we start a training or um, interactions, we like to kind of have a co code of cooperation. And so on the next slide, you'll see our code of cooperation. Um, it might seem a little, um, you might think, gosh, we're in a webinar. I didn't know I was going to be so interactive. But like Mitch explained to you, we're going to be um, asking you to have some conversations. And so um, this is a code of cooperation we like to use. I think one um, you know, interesting thing as we think about this tonight is um, suspending our certainty and kind of being open-minded and hearing what other people have to say and um, also celebrating our diversity. We all bring different perspectives. And um, so I think that's really important as we look to grow our schools and grow in our leadership. Um, it's always important to, to listen to others and, and to see what we can learn because we can always learn from each other. We also love the quote on the side by Stephen Covey, um, listen, um, we want to listen, um, not, not with the intent to reply, but um, to understand. And so that's really important. Um, on the next slide, we have our goals for the evening. Um, and really, um, when, when Shale and I were planning, we were kind of laughing because um, we spend a lot of time talking about these things. And we could spend a whole day um, really on these topics. But um, we're, we want to kind of examine and understand personalized learning and how it relates to your vision. We want to identify um, effective change management strategies and then um, give you an opportunity to reflect on your own leadership styles um, and ways that you can build a positive culture within your building. So I think those are kind of all of our housekeeping. So let's dive in, Shayla. So let's get started. So recognizing for several of you and, and seeing some of the chats going back in the room that this is a relatively new platform for you. And to be honest, it's a new platform for Nancy and I as well. So we were really excited to have the opportunity to try it out. So what we thought we would do to really kick things off is to allow you the opportunity to kind of immerse yourself back into groups, but really yet take a deeper dive into what is personalized learning to you. Um, regardless of what your position might be, we know we have some educators, we have some administrators, we have district level, we have some um, corporations that are represented tonight, but really thinking about what personalized learning means to you. But in order to really frame our conversation, in just a minute, I'm going to share with you a slide that has four images. And all four images in some shape or form may represent personalized learning. What we're gonna ask you to do is to take a minute to really examine the four images and to select the one that you feel like best represents what you hope to see happening in your buildings or what you're potentially already starting to see that really gets you excited, what really drives you about the prospect of personalized learning back in your buildings. We will take a minute to show you each of the images up close and in larger view, but after you've had an opportunity to identify your image, we're then gonna ask you to select two to three other individuals to head into a room and really share about why you chose that image and what about that image really spoke to you. So Mitch, if you so wanna go in Shayla, to... yes. Shayla one, one quick thing. I think a couple of people, I'm looking in the chat um, and Mitch, maybe this is something you can answer. Several people say that their avatar is kind of right over top of um, maybe in a awkward spot or they can't see the slides. Is there a way, Mitch, that they can maybe move those out of the way so that they could see the slides? 
Sorry, Shayla, to interrupt. I just thought you know, several people were asking that. I believe that you can grab your avatar at the very top and move it. Okay. And again, the, my issue is that as the administrator, my screen is completely different from everybody else's screen. Okay. So um, uh, I could, I mean, I could shrink the slide a little bit, you know. Um, I think it, it know, looks like I can move like mine if I, if I click in the corner, um, I can like full screen or move things around. I'm, I'm not sure if that's helping. Let me look in the chat and see what other people are saying. Um, okay. Oh, it, it, it says if I click on my avatar, I pop down and out of the way. Um, ah. And Delia suggested just hovering your cursor over it. Okay. Right. All right, and, great. So great um, suggestions. And, Thanks, and, everybody. And Joyce Whitby or Joyce and Tom Whitby have said you can also click on your avatar. And, you know, and it says minim minimize and it puts you on the bottom. So you can try that. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. I'll bring All myself right, down. Thank you. Okay. All right, great. And please continue to use the chat room to kind of keep us informed of things that are happening um, as we're learning through this together. So right now you should see four images, A, B, C, and D. So I'll give you just a second to look at them. In a minute, I'll have Mitch go through each of them and show them a little bit more up close. But again, you're looking at them and, and recognizing you can't hear what's happening. And we know that there's limitations with images. But just if you were to initially walk into a room and see one of these happening, which one would really get you excited or would make you think, yes, we're starting to take that step towards personalized learning. So Mitch, if you would at this point transition to image A, a little bit closer up, now B, C, and our last image D. So as you've identified your image, if you would select two to three other individuals just by clicking on their image, head into your groups, and just briefly discuss why you chose that particular image. What in that image speaks to you? Okay, so you all know the drill because you had a chance to try it before. Uh, click on the avatar of another person and talk about at least one other person. Uh, if you double click, you can have more than one person in a group. And, um, you know, and, and start talking about your image and what, what they chose as their image. Uh, I'll bring myself down and uh, we'll come back up in in a few minutes. Oh, and you can ask questions and text. It, you know, you can, if you don't have a microphone, you can type this into the text and um, hopefully uh, somebody else will see it and respond to that as well. So anyhow, I'll bring myself down. Okay, so let me see. There's, uh, I'm bringing Nancy back up and here's Shayla back up. Uh, she'll be up in a second and Great. So, so given the fact that there's going to be a test, what was the right answer? I know, you see right? <laughs> so the group that I joined, it was really interesting because, you know, we talked about, and, and I think they kind of spoke to the fact that there's elements of personalized learning, I think, within all of the images. But we would love recognizing I only got to join one group, and I think Nancy got to jump into one group. Mm -hmm. But is there anybody that would like to share, like, across the board by raising their hand, kind of what they thought, or if there was one particular image that stuck out more than another, or we'll even flip it around a little bit. If there was an image that really challenged you of, I think that is the complete opposite of what personalized learning would ever look like. So feel free and, and share either one, and Mitch will bring you up to share out with the group. Any brave souls, I know. Souls. If no, oh. Oh, people are moving around. Maybe, um, you know, well, looks like maybe somebody's coming up or is it Mitch? Mitch is coming back. Um, you know, one thing we were talking yeah, about. I, oh. I'm really, I really want to shame you guys. Come on. You are all <laughs> in the classroom. You're in school. You know what it's like when you try to get interaction. And it, it's actually fun to be up here. Um, so somebody click on that raise hand. Ah, we have, uh, we have a volunteer. Okay. We have two volunteers. Okay. okay so I'll bring you up one at a time. Awesome. The shaming worked. <laughs> Stacy, Stacy, thank you for joining us. I'm susceptible to shaming. <laughs> Stacey, share so, with the group kind of what you talked about in your smaller group. 
So we we discussed all of them a little bit, and you know, kind of what we liked, what we didn't like, but. Um, we really liked B for a lot of reasons. There were a couple of things about B that stressed us out a little bit, mm -hmm. um, maybe the size of the room and the number of students, <laughs> but um, the the idea that the kids had a lot of choice over you know, where they sat in their learning space, that they could be in, together in a group, that they could be by themselves, that they had um, not just screens, that they could have a combination of um, computers and you know unplugged or paper um, that they just seem to have a lot of choice in in what they were doing that was Excellent. one thing it's not everything we said but that was that was that was some of what we said that's fantastic thank you so much for sharing and before nancy and i interject mitch was there one other person that wanted to come up and share oh here we go jenny hey. All right. Um, so Stacy and I were in the same group, so I was actually trying to um, get myself out of the the, uh, the window of shame there. Um, but we we also, um, as as Stacy was just saying, it's um, we like the fact that people have technology as an option. But whereas uh, I think it, now I can't see because all the windows are in front of it. But I think it was C where every girl was sitting in front of a computer all by themselves. And we really liked the interaction and the collaboration and the curiosity that that might um, introduce to allow people to have some more choice. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. And I have to tell you, Nancy and I have had the opportunity to do a very similar activity with lots of different groups. And every single time the conversation is different, the responses are different, which really speaks to the fact that personalized learning can take lots of different forms. So often we're asked at the Friday Institute, is there a book that'll tell us exactly how to do personalized learning? Or is there a checklist that we can go through to ensure that every teacher is right on target with personalized learning? But as the word personalized indicates, it's really about knowing each individual person in that room. But also recognizing that in a given classroom, one day may look like image A, but then the very next day may look like image C. And it's allowing students to have flexibility in, you know, kind of leveraging themselves as individuals and having that personal time to work, maybe one on one at a laptop, but then also letting them know that when there are opportunities that they want to share and collaborate and they want to work with other individuals or they want to lead or share in the conversation, that those are environments that are also supported and available to them throughout their learning continuum. So we hope that this kind of sparked your thinking, kind of got everybody in the group. We know it's late in the evening for some of you, but really just kind of got you thinking about what are the possibilities when you start to immerse yourself into personalized learning and what are things that can really start to evolve and happen in classrooms over time as you start to cultivate those cultures that really speak to personalized learning. So that kind of leads us into our next section. So Mitch, I'll let you catch up for just a second, where we move into what are those elements of personalized and digital learning? So on the next slide, we have a question, and, and for this one, we're not gonna ask you to go into groups. We're just gonna ask you to kind of contemplate this on your own, but to really think about a, an individual student. It could be a student that was from 10 years ago in your teaching career. It could be a student that current day today really drives the work that you do. So take just a minute, like maybe 30 seconds to, and for most of you, and if you're like myself, that student immediately pops into my head. Like I know that student that really drives the work that I do and really keeps me striving every day to continue to grow in my own profession to be able to service. So hopefully you all kind of have that student in your mind. And I'll share with you a little bit about the student that, that always comes to my mind. And I talk about him all the time and his name is Shaquille. And Shaquille came to me my second year of teaching and he essentially came to me by default. Um, I was second year teacher in a school and I was in a school with a lot of veteran teachers and it was fourth grade and Shaquille had kind of made his way through the, the chain of teachers so when it came time to place Shaquille into a classroom, the other fourth grade teachers secretly got together and kind of said, oh, we're going to push him off to Shayla. Like we, 
you know, we've heard through the grapevine, the student's very disruptive, he doesn't do well, he's, you know, constantly an issue. So we're gonna let Shayla take a stab at him. And really over the course of time, it was me sitting with him and really starting to understand him as an individual and understanding not only his day in my classroom, but really starting to understand what environment was he bringing with him, what was happening in his day before he even arrived at school, and what was happening after his day, and how could I capitalize that and really help him to understand that the environment that surrounded him wasn't what ultimately had to predict his learning outcomes. But it was also me starting to look at how do I change the way that he potentially learns, recognizing that more of the traditional format of him sitting in a seat and maybe even working in collaborative groups wasn't working. Through conversation, he and I really quickly identified he preferred to work individually or with one other person. It was not a comfort zone for him to be in large groups. So again, I constantly think back to Shaquille in the work that I do, really thinking about, am I keeping every student in a student population in mind as we think about personalized learning? But as the next image shares, which Nancy and I come to this image repeatedly, and some of you may have seen this before, but we feel like this image really speaks to the Shaquilles of the world. And it hopefully speaks to whichever student came to your mind, that really what this image is saying is that Equity doesn't mean equal inputs for all students, but instead it's about understanding the needs of each student and ensuring that each student has what they need to reach their potential. And that's what we should be really striving to accomplish. It's, you know, for a really long time education, we, we predominantly focus purely on the equality and equity portion. And now we're to a phase of learning where we're starting to recognize we have to make that transition more into liberation and allowing our students an opportunity to really understand their own learning process to talk about that learning process with us as educators and start to design their own pathways and their own pace for how they want that learning to occur. But I think the last image of inclusion just really helps us take that last leap into personalized learning of how did they then become a part? They're included in the learning process. It's no longer happening to them, it's happening with them. How are they a part of the team and how are they coaching each other on I'm really starting to understand others, individuals in the classroom and how they learn. And those of us at the Friday Institute are convinced that there's even a fifth image yet to come. Um, you know, that could be a whole other conversation of what's going to be that next phase beyond inclusion. But we hope that this image just kind of helps you and, and speaks to that student that you were thinking about, but also helps you to create a frame of reference of as we continue in our discussion around personalized learning, what is it we're really striving to get to? And it ultimately is that level of inclusion. So to kind of bring it back around, um, we, we will share with you kind of a more defined definition around personalized learning, that it really refers to instruction in which the pace of learning and the instructional approach are optimized for the needs of each learner. So Nancy and I kind of think about this as it's really about pace, path, and place in personalized learning. It's, you know, allowing the students to communicate what pace works well for them, still recognizing that you're there to facilitate and coach them along and not, you know, allow them on one objective, but giving them some flexibility and some coaching in regards to how do they go about pacing their learning styles in order to still meet the objectives, but also developing a path. Um, you know, in what sequence do they feel like they are really going to be successful? What are areas that maybe they feel really passionate about and they want to dive into first? Or what are those areas that are really challenging? And how are they going to ensure that they are also tackling those areas as well? And then lastly, creating that environment and that place for their personalized learning to start to happen. And, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now about flexible learning spaces and things like that. And it's something that we will definitely tap into in future um, sessions throughout this series, but really taking a look at, you know, it's not always about equipping your room with brand new furniture. Sometimes it's just having a conversation with the students and asking them, well, do you prefer to sit on the floor? Do you like to be at a table? Do you like to be in groups? And just allowing them to start to modify and adapt the classroom for their learning needs as well. So we hope that the definition kind of sheds some light. But as we transition to the next slide, 
we recognize that as instructional leaders, that for educators to really start to make that shift to personalized learning, they have to first identify what traditional instructional models or strategies are they continuing to hold on to? They just relinquish, they, you know, they're gonna leave it, they're gonna leave the room kicking and screaming to give it up, but recognizing that in order to really start to transition ourselves more into a personalized learning environment, we have to be able to make that transition to more of a digital age learning space. So this chart really speaks to, and this by no means encompasses everything, but it should really help you to start to first identify where are you on the traditional instructional model versus the digital age? And are you finding yourself as a leader a little bit more on the digital age? And if, if not, what are some things that you could start to do as an instructional leader to model that? But more importantly, we hope that you can use this image to start to identify where your teachers are. You know, you're probably already starting to, to kind of go through your faculty or staff and think about, ooh, that totally aligns with this teacher. This is maybe what I should work with them on in order to help them make that shift. But also recognizing it's a transition that doesn't happen overnight. But sometimes this chart can really help bring it to the forefront for a lot of teachers and start to spark that conversation of what we mean between more of traditional instructional models versus digital age. Again, recognizing there's a time and a place for all of them, but it is that opportunity to expand our learning opportunities and expand how we teach in our classrooms to be a little bit more inclusive of those on the digital age learning continuum. So as you know, when Nancy and I were planning and thinking about this, one of the things that we oftentimes turn to at the Friday Institute is we, we kind of want a framework. Um, we want a pathway, again, recognizing there is no one way to go about personalized learning, but we also recognize that it's important to have some type of guide, something that's gonna allow you to kind of have a checks and balances, but to also know that you're moving in the right direction. And are you addressing every area within your school to ensure that you're supporting a sustainable culture? So on the next slide, we will share with you a framework that is from the book that Nancy and Marianne recently wrote and published. Nancy will talk a little bit more about it at the end of the session. But within the book, it really provides a framework um, that, you know, while no one will disagree that we want to personalize learning for all of our students, the path to get there can sometimes seem overwhelming. And we hope that this framework really creates a roadmap for leaders like yourselves to really help guide you as you implement the change. Um, because we have to start with the vision. And then it's once you've identified that vision and you know what it is that you want to see happening in the classrooms, where do you go from there? And what are all the various areas and components that you need to consider and recognize in order for that transition to start to happen? So with that, I'm gonna transition it over to Nancy, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about how do we start to lead that change now that you have a vision and you kind of have a framework, what are the next steps? Great, thanks, Shayla. Great, thank so, you. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, am I? Do you oh, want to hear the echo there? Do you want to hear the echo there? Nope, I hear you. I hear you fine. Okay. okay. Nice. Super. So, as, in the next slide and the next section, we're really going to be thinking about leading that change. And as we lead that change, you as a school leader, in whatever your role is, with school or administrative team, a, a school library, Librarian are leading. And as a leader, it's important that you know and understand um, where you're. So, on the next slide, um, I want you to look um, a bullets here. And at where do you feel like as you transition, because you all are all transitioning, whether your goal is personalized learning, digital learning, um, student centered learning. You will all have a vision and you're moving towards that vision. And so um, I want you to, and where are you in making this transition? Um, and Mitch, I don't know if you can um, advance to the um, a slide. So the interesting thing is, Nancy, you're gone. Um, you're not up, the, up here right now. Um, I'm going to, so Shayla, yeah. you're, your audio is there. Nancy, you yeah. might have to refresh your screen and which, and I'll bring you back up once you've refreshed your screen. Um, 
And then Shayla, can you talk to these slides a little bit? Absolutely. So I'll so I figured, you back up to the I figured you could. Yeah. So if you wouldn't mind just backing up to the previous slide, because I think Nancy was kind of breaking up. So I'm not sure everyone heard exactly what she was talking about here. But um, this is one where, you know, we do ask you just to kind of take a minute to reflect on where you feel like a majority of your teachers are today. So, you know, as you left your buildings or as you left the district, or if you're a classroom teacher and you were working with other teachers, at the end of the day, as you walked out the door, if you had to kind of classify them in one of these areas, how would you, which one would you select? I'll give you just a second to look through those. And Nancy, are you back with us? Yes, I'm back. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's no worries. Know, so we just right? kind of backed up a little bit because you broke up while we were while you were oh, talking great. about Thank this you. one. So do you okay. want to take it from here? Yes. All right. So you all can type those in the chat. Where do you where do you feel like your teacher or or your colleagues are coming from? All right. I'm looking in the chat and I see change. Yes. What else? Anxious. Yes. Confused or resistant. Still unsure. Yeah. So lots of resistance and anxious. Yes. So, you know, um, we have a there's model for a managing complex change, which is on the next slide. I think it gives us a really help understand teachers' perspectives. And it's really important that that we as leaders understand some of us to get frustrated with our teachers. Um, you know, we've told you 300 times where we're going or, or you know, you got to get on board. Um, and so sometimes it's frustrating. But I think what Nostra's models does for us is it allows us to help understand maybe where some of their anxiety is coming from. Um, or, so as you look at Nostra's and and some are familiar with Nostra's, and um, for others um, of you, maybe it isn't um, it's familiar. But if, as we look at it, Shayla, um, can you all hear me okay? You're still breaking up a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you take this, and maybe I'll, um, I'm sitting in the same place, but I'll let you, um, maybe I'll move close to the router. Okay. Absolutely. So this is an image that we've put in front of education leaders like yourselves, but we've also not been afraid to put this in front of teachers. And we've oftentimes asked them the question that we asked you previously of, you know, in their own minds, where do they feel like they are right now? But then it's important for them to also recognize where they feel like the gaps exist. But sometimes as leaders, we're maybe a little resistant to put ourselves out there and be open to that feedback of, well, to Nancy's point, what do you mean you don't feel like there's a vision? The vision's on our website. It's you know painted on the wall as you walk in the building. But sometimes it goes beyond that of, it's not just about the vision, it's that maybe they actually aren't seeing it in action. Um, or they're not feeling like that vision is really being replicated, translated into the work that's happening or into what they see you doing. Um, so this is again, just a model that we love to use and we hope that it'll serve as a resource for you as you really start to unpack and think about, as I'm gonna lead this change into personalized learning, first identifying where potential gaps exist and starting to unpack what are some strategies and things that you need to do in order to equip teachers with more resources or what types of incentives might teachers need in order to feel as if you know they can really move forward and not feel that there's resistance anymore and they can really feel success. And when we talk about things like incentives, we don't always talk about financial incentives, um, but it might be taking it a step further beyond necessarily, you know, if you come to this professional learning, you get a coupon to wear jeans on a Friday. Oftentimes, a lot of the incentives that we're referencing are intrinsic motivators. Um, things like, you know, just accolades. Um, recognizing when they maybe complete a micro-credential or they get a digital badge. For a lot of our educators, that is incentive enough to motivate them to want to explore new types of learning environments. But it's also something that we start to see translate back over into the classroom, where teachers will also start to use a chart like this to identify, well, if my students are feeling really anxious 
or my students are every day, I feel like they're so frustrated. Well, maybe I'm not providing them with the right resources. Um, or if, you know, every day you feel like, oh my gosh, I, I feel like I just, I've got to back up and start again. Every day they feel like I've got to back up and start again. Well, maybe it's because there's not a clear plan that's been laid out for the students where they don't really clearly understand where it is that you're hoping to take them so that they are motivated to be a part of that along the way. But as education leaders to start to put this into practice as well. Yeah. And, you know, one other thing um, about incentives, another great incentive. Um, Shayla, can you hear me better now? I can. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, other incentives is is just recognizing teachers in a in a weekly newsletter or in in your shout outs, giving teachers shout outs for the things that you're seeing happening in their classrooms. That's another great incentive. Um, so hopefully, like Shayla said, Nosters um, is a way that as you begin to see within different teachers frustration, maybe they need the resources, or if they're anxious, um, they really need the skills. So with that, um, as we begin yeah. to... So, so a question that I had is, you know, when you're talking yeah. about incentives, so there's positive incentives, but it, it could also be, it seems to me, that there are too many negative incentives sometimes. So mm. that if I'm a teacher or if, I'm a, or if I'm a student and I know that if I mess up, it really hurts, that I can't afford to fail, I'm less inclined to try new things. Or, and, and the negative incentives go in, in many different directions, but that's, that's just one. So that's that's a factor also, isn't it? Yeah, I definitely, Mitch. And you know, I think that that's the perfect. Um, it's actually a great transition too, as we think about. Um, in order to build a positive culture, there has to be trust. And so, if if teachers don't feel like that they trust what you're saying, or or there are too many negative incentives, I think there is there does become um, a lot of resistance. And um, because I like to say, um, you need to inspect what you expect. And so um, you have to be able to um, back up what you're saying with your actions. Um, and, and creating that culture of trust is so important. And so as we go into the next um, section here with leadership and culture, I think Nostra's definitely plays into to all of that. But as we think about um, on the next slide, if trust is, is key in building a culture, because in order to make a change, you have to have a culture that, um, that is positive and that supports that change. Um, what are some of the strategies that, that you're using to build an effective culture in your school or in your district? I know some of you might be district um, level. Um, but you know, I think that this is a really important one because we know that trust is not built overnight. And um, for some people, it's easier. Um, for some teachers, you quickly can establish that trust. And for other teachers, it takes a lot of time. Um, and so I think inspecting what you expect is really important. And, you know, so so what a, an example there is if all we're doing, you know, if we're talking about personalized learning and, and making this transition and, and we want to see these great things, but yet then the only thing we're talking about in faculty meetings um, or, or in every one-on-one -on -one conversation we're having with teachers is test scores and where their students are on their benchmarks and and um, maybe making teachers feel feel um, negative or punitive about those test scores, not you know not not using the data in a way that can help inform and help them move forward. Um, that can be really um, frustrating for teachers, and teachers think, well, what? Or if you ask teachers to try new things and develop a growth mindset, but yet you're you're walking around and and in classroom observations, you're not honoring that they're trying new things, and maybe you're marking them down or. Um, or you know maybe putting them on action plans because you don't see what you want to see, you know you see um, maybe a disorganized or what you perceive as a, as a disorganized classroom or, or a teacher um, then that can be really um, difficult in building that trust. <coughs> so um, I'm curious, does anybody want to share or I can look in the chat um, what strategies um, have you used to build an effective culture? Again, knowing it takes time and many many things. Oh, yeah. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to come up and share something they're doing. Yeah, this is another time to click on that raise hand button. Uh, don't make me shame you. <laughs> uh, so maybe talk I about the... <laughs> maybe, yes, you know, and I... 
Go ahead. I'll give you another one. Um, that um, and it looks like there's some great conversation happening in the chat too. But I'll give you another one. We work with a principal um, in Chapel Hill who um, does a great. He does a flaffle, and it's a failure raffle. And he has a box that sits in his um, in his staff room. And anytime a teacher tries something new, but um, that that whatever it was that they tried didn't work or didn't work exactly as they planned, they fill out just a short little ticket um, about what it is they tried and what they learned from it. And then every week at his um, weekly, he has the flaffle or pulls a name out of the out of the box and um, and gives that teacher um, kind of honors that teacher and um, lets them kind of share what they what they tried and what they learned from it. But that's a great way to, you know, you're trying to build that trust and a culture of growth mindset and a, and a culture of trying new things within your staff. That's a great way to um, build that trust. Does anybody else have anything, any things that they're doing um, in building that positive culture? I have really good wait time because I was a, <laughs> I know. All right. Well, but I am looking at our time, Shayla. And because, um, because of that, I think I'm going to keep on moving on. Um, okay. But just thinking and, and maybe just noting to yourself, um, what am I doing? And think and really thinking about that with, with your other teachers and or with your administrative team, I think is really important. Um, so as we think about us building trust, um, one of the things that that's really important um, to think about is our own leadership style and how our leadership style might be um, impacting our teachers. And so accidental diminishers, um, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with this, but it comes from um, Liz Wiseman's book, The Multipliers. And it's a great way for us to think um, as a leader or as a colleague, um, what are we doing that might be um, impacting and the way that others view us and the culture that we're creating in our school? So um, I'll give everybody a chance. You know, Mitch, is there any way to make that bigger? Or um, I don't know if they can they can all see it, but I'll read out. There are six types of leadership styles. Um, the optimist is one. So as I'm reading these, I'd love for you to think about which one um, you most, most relate to. Um, that, that you feel like your leadership style um, is most like. So the optimist, their intention is to create um, a belief that the team can do it, but sometimes that um, outcome is people wonder if they appreciate the struggle and the, possi um, the possibility of failure. So sometimes um, that's, the, that's their problem. The rescuer, um, so the rescuer, their intention is to ensure that people are successful and protect their reputation. So they often are running in as a leader, they're running in and fixing the problems that they see. But the outcome is their people become dependent on them too much and um, it weakens their own reputation. If we go down right below that, there's the idea guy. So maybe your leadership style is you're the idea person. You're always throwing out all of these ideas and um, you know, you want like you're throwing out ideas to stimulate others, but your the outcome is that you overwhelm others too much, um, and they shut down, right? Because they're like, oh gosh, too many things are you know you're throwing too much at me. I I can't keep keep up. Um, another leadership style is the always on, and I think a lot of um, school leaders probably fall into this. Um, their intention is to create interactions, energy, and share their point of view, but um, the outcome is they consume all the space and um, people tune them out. So, so they try to be too much. They're trying to do everything and then um, people kind of begin to tune them out. Down over, if we move kind of back to the, to the left, the, um, the pace setter. So their intention is to set a high standard for quality, but the outcome is that other people become spectators um, or give up when they can't keep up. Um, I think we've all probably worked with a pace setter before, and sometimes we just, we think we can't do it. We can't keep up with them. So we just shut down. And then the last one is the rapid responder. Um, again, a lot of principals fall into this to keep their organization moving fast. Um, that's their intention. But the outcome is that they move fast, but their organization cannot move with them. 
So um, I know I just read a lot to you, but I wanted to make sure that you could, um, because I wasn't sure if you could see it. But um, just thinking about how each of these, and you can examine them further, and you, some of you have probably already Googled it, um, but thinking about what your leadership style most resembles, and then also looking at we all have the best intentions, but sometimes our intentions are perceived in ways that that impact our culture. And so, knowing um, what type of person you are, like I'm, I'm definitely, um, I'm probably a couple. Well, we all probably have like a primary and a secondary, but I'm definitely an idea person. And so, understanding um, that if I'm the idea guy, um, what impact that has on my colleagues, and um, how I have to watch for that as I build the culture within my team. Perfect. Shayla, anything else you wanna add there? No, I would just say like, I can constantly come back to this, um, especially when I'm working in groups with groups of teachers and I've, I've kind of to a degree memorized it so that I can also start to identify around the room who are my rescuers and who are the optimists to make sure that you are providing opportunities for all of them to feel comfortable in the space, especially if it's around professional learning but then allowing them to also take this back into their classrooms and think about, well, how does it apply to their students as well? Um, because I would venture to say they could very quickly start to see how their students could fit into some of these categories and to help the students start to have conversations around, are they a rescuer um, or all they, you know, do they feel like they're always on and do they feel that responsibility to always be on? So a lot of different ways that the accidental diminisher can really feed into your transition to personalized learning. Mm -hmm. And you know, Shayla, I'm wondering, um, because of our time, um, do we want to honor everyone's time? Do we should we just um, kind of briefly mention the leading versus managing and then Yes, kind of that's kind of what I was gonna do because we do want to be okay. very respectful of your time. But we did want to talk a little bit about the change management, which I kind of feel like I got the pleasure of addressing the white elephant in the room because it is always that struggle of time. And you know, so we kind of asked that question. Do your values align with how you spend your time? It's one thing to identify where gaps exist and to know what your leadership style is and to have a very clear vision. But if you are not setting aside time to lead versus being consumed every day by the management part of your role as a leader, you're not really modeling for your teachers, but you're also not letting them see that this is really what's important as part of the culture in your building. So if we had had a little bit more time, if you wanna to advance to the next slide, Mitch, we would have had you break into groups and really start to think about what are things that you do on a daily basis that really contribute to you leading the initiative towards personalized learning? But then what are the things that you find really consume your, your time that's more on the management side? And we would encourage you to, even in your own time, either after the webinar or even to tomorrow or as you're driving to work, just kind of start to think about and actually create a T-chart and make that list, kind of those pros and cons of how am I balancing my day? And what I'd like to do is to take a single day and really think through every minute or every hour of that day, how did I utilize my time? And if you find that you're really heavy on the management side and not really contributing in much to the leading, that is that opportunity for you to stop and reflect, okay, again, back to that vision, how am I aligning myself with the vision and allowing opportunities for me to really model and lead that transition within the school. And then below, just start to think about, well, what are some of those transition strategies? What are some ways that I can start to shift away from not feeling that I have to do as much of the managing and allow myself a little bit more time to lead? And that's what really kind of guides us into our next opportunity, which is maximizing the potential of your team. So often Nancy and I go into schools and we sit down with instructional leaders or we work at the district level and they're really struggling because they feel like they're so overwhelmed and they're trying to do it all on their own. And we tell them all the time, you know, you don't need the consensus of the group. You, you know, you really need momentum, but you can't do that alone. You really need a team within your school that's going to help to back you. So we oftentimes reference um, Edward Deming and his concept behind the square root of an organization and recognizing that 
The square root of your organization is really what is going to help you gain that momentum that you need to ultimately see a transition start to happen. And there's actually David Langford, he um, founded Langford International. They've done a ton of professional development around how do you really maximize that square root because oftentimes we think we have to get everybody on board in order to move forward. But they actually talk about if you have a small staff like 25, or if you even have a larger staff like 81, take that square root. So if you have a small staff of 25, it would be five dedicated people. And they say that is truly all you need, really committed to your vision in order to see that transition start to happen. So we would encourage you over the course of the next couple of days to sit down, Look at the total number of people that you work with, identify that square root, and then start to think about who are those people. But going back to the accidental diminishers, starting to think about, do I have a balance of individuals that are really helping me um, to drive that vision forward? So that brings up, I know that was a ton of information in a short amount of time, but Nancy, do you want to bring it back around and kind of talk a little yeah. bit about next steps and how they can join us for the next session? Yes, great. So our next session, um, we, we will be focusing on um, empowering students and learner agency. And um, with that, we hope to see you on February 13th. Hopefully, um, my internet will be working better. Um, sorry about that tonight, but I appreciate Shayla jumping right in there. Um, with that, we did briefly talk, um, and on the next slide, um, We'll be looking again, we looked um, at creating a vision for teaching and learning, just talking about how important that was and building the culture of trust and um, a little, some about change management. But um, we also at the Freddie Institute have another opportunity for school leaders. Um, we have a great, um, a leading schools opportunity coming up, um, a, a, an event in Portland, Oregon um, at the end of June. And so we have information there um, on that. But with that, Mitch, we really appreciate you. Um, yes, we really appreciate you inviting us and having us. And, um, and we look forward to being back here on February 13th. Um, I'm sorry we, we kind of ran out of time. Now, now we know we need to plan less than. Yes. Right. So I just I want to say I went into this with really high expectations because I've, you know, I've worked with, with Sheila now for the last I don't know three or four months and Nancy I've known you for five or six years okay. and so like I said a, I, I had a really high bar and I have to say the two of you exceeded it so it's been a pleasure <laughs> working with you it's been Thank a great you. listening and and watching the interaction with people and um Thank you so much for appearing. I can't wait till February thirteenth um, to 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 hear the next the next step about work you know working with students, and um, you know hope you have a good intervening month. Uh, may the weather get warmer. Yes, and thank please you. Invite your friends and colleagues to join us on the thirteenth. Bring them in right. um, and invite your square root. Invite your team to come in and join in and, and be a part of the conversation. Right. On the 13th, we don't, they don't need to have attended this session, although we did record this session and we can get you the slides. So if you want people to see this, you can, but nobody needs to have been to this session to come to, come to the next one. Um, just hopefully to register so that we can send them, a, you know, the confirmation and where to go. So, um, yeah, we'll have a great rest of January. Oh, I'm sorry. Really quickly. Is there a way for them to get Nancy and webinar in case they have questions or they they want to dive a little bit deeper into anything that we covered tonight is, is there I'm, i missed the question part is there a way for them to get the no, slides our contact information no the contact information nancy and i will you include that in your follow-up or um i can i think um yes you know something it's right here if, if you would like slide. me to you you can certainly reach uh nancy and shayla via twitter right right there yes, that's and um if you'd like then in the uh email once the uh recording is up i'll i'll send everybody your your email addresses great okay absolutely okay. thank you thanks mitch so much for having us thanks oh, it was great to see so many friends um yeah thank you. well okay so see you in a month okay yes Bye. and don't miss next week with scott it's going to be great i know yeah he's, he's great next, too next thank week. you yeah, yeah next right. week next Bye. week tuesday 
Okay, and uh, again, my name is Mitch Weisberg for EdChat Interactive, and I'm signing off. Hope to see you next Tuesday. Hope you see to see you February 13th. And uh, Tom Whippy and I will both, and I think Steve Anderson will be there also. Uh, we'll all be at FETC. So if anybody's going to be there, I hope we run into you in FETC. Take care. Good night, and see you soon. Bye.